Ladies and gentlemen, John Avalon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexandros. It is, uh, it is a pleasure to be here at this temple of political nerddom, and I mean that in the best possible way, because I am a proud political history nerd. Um, and I've been here before with Rudy Giuliani when he was running, and previously with No Labels, and it's a delight to be back, and I love all the uh, archival material you all have. It's just, uh, it's a wonderful institution. Um, I should also say that, uh, Alexandros said I, I live in New York with two of my children and my wife. Um, that would imply that I have more than two children. Uh, I have it on good authority. Uh, they are my only two children, um, and I love them very much. Um, at any rate, uh, it's a pleasure to be here to talk to you about Washington's farewell address, um, because it's really one of the most timely and timeless documents in uh, American history. Imagine if we had a memo written to us by George Washington, the first founding father, that was the sum total of the hard-won wisdom he accumulated over 50 years in war and peace. And not only that, it was written to us as future generations of Americans specifically to warn about the forces he feared might destroy our democratic republic. What if it was written with the help of Alexander Hamilton and James Madison, which it was? And what if the three big threats he foresaw were hyperpartisanship, excessive debt, and foreign wars, as well as foreign influence in our elections and democratic debates? That's what Washington's farewell address is. It is a great gift that he left us at the end of his two terms as president. It was Washington's final revolutionary act. We, for, we take the two-term precedent for president for granted. At the time, of course, the history of revolutions in the world was that the tyrant was deposed by a new military leader who quickly became a new tyrant of his own. And there was no guarantee that Washington would not follow the same path. And so when he decided, a genuinely reluctant president, by the way, um, to step down after two terms, it was a revolutionary act. It set the two-term precedent that every president followed until Franklin Roosevelt, and after which we had the good sense to write it in the Constitution. Um, but Washington could have written this valedictory victory lap. He had come in at a place of real crisis for our young republic. Um, remembers the Art of Articles of Confederation were an absolute failure. That's why we have the Constitutional Convention at which he serves as president. And Washington really helped unite the nation. That was one of his great principles, one of his great precepts, what I call pillars of liberty, which I'll get more into in a moment. And he could have been very justified to say that, you know, we have stabilized the nation and now I'm going off to a well-deserved retirement at Mount Vernon with Martha Washington and um, good luck. But he set a new presidential precedent with his farewell address too, which is the presidential warning. And indeed, most presidential farewells follow this example, Eisenhower's farewell being the most famous example uh, where he warned about the military industrial complex. It was actually originally the military congressional industrial complex and then Congress was edited out for fear of offending uh, some of his cohorts in Washington. So this is a speech, an address. It was actually never given out loud. It was published in a newspaper on September 19th, 1796, 20 years after the Declaration of Independence. Um, he wanted it published in a newspaper because it seemed like a little our Republican way of disseminating the information, not to simply elected officials, but to all the people. Um, and he really did want it to be a message that could guide our country when he was no longer on the stage. For so long, he had been the glue that had held the nation together. And he knew that he would have to, if he succeeded, create a culture that could outlast him. Um, but he wanted to offer this parting wisdom that people could refer to and repair to when he was no longer president, when he was no longer alive. And it is a remarkable act of thoughtfulness on the part of President Washington. It is a generous act, and it was greeted that way by the American people. For the first 150 years of our republic, it was more widely reprinted than the Declaration of Independence. And reprints of Washington's farewell would surge in times of trouble and war, particularly the War of 1812, around the Civil War. And I'll get to the afterlife of the address in a bit, because that, to me, is some of the most fascinating aspects of it. But let's set the stage for Washington coming up with these threats, but these pillars of liberty. 
Washington, as I mentioned, was a reluctant president. He really actually, in almost a charming way, doubted his own capacity to be president. He was confident in war. He was fascinated with farming. He was not sure he had the stuff to be a statesman. Um, he was not the most brilliant, the most witty of the founding fathers. He was taciturn. He adopted the mask of command, as many military people do. Um, and after his first term as president, he really wanted to retire. Um, and so he began working on a farewell address with James Madison, who at the time was his chief assistant for all things legislative and lyrical. He was fascinating. Madison was serving in Congress and would write both the president's message to Congress and the congressional response to the message. <laughs> Madison was a, 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 a bright and fascinating and somewhat vacillating guy over the course of his career. Um, when Washington let it be known that he wanted to retire after one term, his cabinet freaked out, to put it in contemporary terms. Um, Washington uh, was not a member of a party as a matter of principle. The Constitution doesn't mention political parties, a point I always like to point out, because parties now believe they are the purpose of our politics. They intentionally are not in the Constitution. I will also point out that uh, journalists are written into the Constitution, um, uh, lest we have any doubt about the broader structures that were in mind by the Founding Fathers. Um, and it caused him great pain to see uh, Hamilton and Jefferson scheming to create political parties under his nose. They were his two most talented surrogate sons. But the threat of Washington retiring was the one thing that could unite Was uh, Hamilton and Jefferson. They both agreed that it would be a calamity for the country, that if Washington stepped down, that it could very well spark a civil war, which was already very much in the Founding Fathers' minds. We take the success of our nation for granted. We sometimes treat the Founding Fathers as omniscient. Um, they weren't. They were, and it's much more interesting to understand them as flawed human beings. It makes their wisdom more accessible. Um, but they all agreed that Washington, if he stepped down, it would be a disaster. And it was the one thing they all agreed on. So Washington reluctantly agreed to stay on in office. And it was a, a, a fascinating time in American politics, not only because they are literally establishing institutions on the fly that endure to this day, um, but because his administration is under attack at home and abroad. Um, the birth of the two-party system in part occurs because the French are furious after their revolution that Washington has declared neutrality between France and England, and indeed many Americans are too, in particular Madison and Jefferson. Um, and so they start scheming to undermine the administration from within. As a result, Washington distances himself from them and really aligns himself with his Treasury Secretary, Alexander Hamilton, even after he goes home uh, to New York to uh, begin a law career because he's down to $500 and has small children. Um, and for those of you who are fans of the play Hamilton, can I get an amen, right? Okay. Um, the song, One Last Time, is written uh, about the writing of the farewell address, and I interviewed Lynn manuel for the book. But he and Hamilton really get to work. They, he dusts off James Madison's draft, and Hamilton gets to work and rewrites it almost entirely. And it very much reflects the pressures he is under at that point. Um, he is anguished by the rise of partisanship in our country. Um, he is fascinated uh, about the role of debt. He's reflexively against it, but Hamilton has convinced him that a degree of debt can be a good thing. Excessive debt is what tears down empires. Um, so that, that fixation reflects Hamilton's involvement. And finally, the point about foreign powers, foreign wars, entangling alliances is the phrase you may know. It's the only phrase people tend to know about the farewell address. In fact, it does not appear in the farewell address, by the way. It's uh, Jefferson's first inaugural. But it sums up Washington's determination to have a foreign policy of independence, to achieve peace through strength, to not throw in with any other nation and mistake their interests for our own. And what's animating that is his real fury at the French for trying to weigh in on American politics. They dispatched an ambassador named Citizen Genet to try to undermine his administration and overthrow it if necessary. And Ma Madison and Jefferson were to a degree complicit in this effort. Um, that is a fascinating fact of our early history uh, that seemed kind of quaint until this election. You know, usually when Washington's farewell is discussed in the context of foreign policy, it gets brought up in the context of Vietnam, as it was, or perhaps the Iraq War. No foreign wars, no entangling alliances. But really, his preoccupation is foreign powers trying to influence our elections and our democratic debates, little d. Um, and that, of course, is not an abstract concern to us today. And it's a reminder, as Harry Truman used to say, that the only thing new in the world is the history you don't know. Um, 
So he recognizes these threats, and they're reflected in his time as president and his understanding, his life lessons up to that point, but also his understanding of history up to that point. You know, we take our country success for granted at times. We also, I think, take our democracy for granted at times. It's worth reflecting that the smart money in Europe said America was destined to fail. That there had never been a democracy that existed on our scale, 13 colonies sprawled across the seaboard, that maybe it could work in a few Swiss cantons, but it could not work in a diverse country that had Germans and French and British and Dutch all living side by side. That passed for diversity at the time, but it really was because those folks have been fighting each other for centuries in the continent. So this was an audacious experiment. And the Founding Fathers really did believe in applied history, learning the lessons of history and applying them. That is built into a lot of our institutions. And it's a reminder of why studying history and civic education is so important. They really understood that. They really applied it. So Washington's drawing on his understanding of history as well as the lessons of his own life. And he wants to prescribe these what I call pillars of liberty. Renewable sources of strength that could help keep those destructive forces at bay that had destroyed other democratic republics in the past. And the reason I call them pillars of liberty is that to the founding fathers, the word liberty and independence and freedom were not synonymous. They were distinct. And I think we treat them as basically interchangeable today. But what they understood is that freedom could be a state of nature, that liberty implied a degree of self-discipline. And that's what a civil society depends upon. For citizens, for states, we need to figure out how to strive for self-sufficiency, and that requires self-discipline. So the first pillar of liberty, the real focus of Washington's entire presidency in some ways, is national unity. We do not have a united nation, really. Washington embodied many of the things that could unite us, but he was establishing a national character. It's one of the reasons he toured the United States. He was very focused on the dangers of regional divides and the rise of regional political parties. Another way his message is relevant today. He was desperately concerned that we could devolve into a civil war if people thought of themselves as Virginians first and South Carolinians first and New Hampshireites first and not as Americans first. He said, citizens by birth or choice, the name America is what unites us. And it has a right to claim your just loyalty, your jealous loyalty over any regional prejudices and discriminations. And he really devotes himself to this concept of national unity. And he warns against folks he called pretend patriots. People who would pretend to be more American, to pretend to be more patriotic, and would be undermining national unity in the process. Already, he recognized that as a real danger, that people would try to parade themselves as true Americans, but be dividing Americans against one another. And he said, watch for that. Watch out for those folks. Don't fall for it. Which brings me to the second pillar of liberty, political moderation. Now, moderation has gotten a bad rap in recent decades, and I think to our great detriment. It is seen as a mushy middle position, not strong, weak, vacillating. I think that's fundamentally false and misunderstands the nature of democracy. Democracy depends on principled compromise. The Constitution came out of principled compromise. There is nothing weak about principled compromise. It is the nature and essence of a representative democracy. Nobody gets everything. And Washington believed that we needed to fight against factions. He recognized that the nature of humanity is to drive towards tribalism. That's built in our DNA. But we need to transcend our tribalism, and that means holding political factions in check. And the best way to do that is by asserting a muscular form of moderation that is rooted in principle, but has a suspicious eye towards people who would divide us, towards political factions that would try to impose special interests where the national interest should prevail. And he was skeptical of populism. He was skeptical of the French Revolution. You know, the idea that just because they were advocating an empire of liberty and took inspiration for the United States, if you've got mass executions in the streets of Paris, that's a new form of tyranny. Washington and Hamilton and Adams in particular understood that Americans had an obligation to walk a middle line between monarchy and the mob. And that is not a vacillating position. That's a principled position. It's a wise position. And not everyone agreed with that, obviously. 
There is a ir almost irresistible tendency to move towards faction, but what Washington warned very clearly, and I think presciently, is the danger of political factions run amok is that it could create a deadlock democracy where the parties forget they're not the purpose of our politics. They create a deadlock democracy that becomes so inefficient and ineffective that it leads to citizen frustration who then are susceptible to the siren song of a demagogue with authoritarian ambitions. That was an explicit warning Washington made that the founding fathers understood. That had been the story of the decline of democracies before, which is why we should all pay attention not only to history, but to civics and our political life every day. Washington warned us about those dangers. And the alternative is venerating moderation as a source of strength and wisdom. This is rooted in classical Greek wisdom, by the way, you know, the golden mean, beware of extremes. It's good advice. It's not weak, it's not vacillating. It's actually wise and strong and rooted in our best traditions. Washington also understood fiscal discipline as a pillar of liberty. You know, we sometimes think of these debates as abstract and currently both political parties uh, have a pretty bad record on excessive deficit and debt. There are people who believe in it in a principled manner, but they seem to be consistently outvoted after campaign season begins once they get into Congress. But again, and this comes really directly from Hamilton, um, a degree of debt can be a good thing for a young nation. You know, if you look at the history of, of the Revolutionary War, the failure of the states to work together, particularly on issues of finances, was an existential threat. You need to get the money right for civil society to work. Um, a degree of debt can be fine. Hamilton was an advocate of that. He learned that from Robert Morris, the financier of the American Revolution, a fascinating figure who's been unfairly forgotten, who later in life um, actually ended up in debtor's prison because he got overextended, and Washington visited him there, the only president to visit a friend in prison. Um, Washington's solution simply was, and you see this theme over and over, avoid overextension. Excessive deficit and debt is a force that destroys empires. Do not pass on to future generations what the current generation should pay for itself. Wars, he understood, were expensive. That's why we raised taxes or bonds in the past to pay for them. That's why wars of choice themselves are a form of indulgence. And we have an obligation to use our shared dollars to develop infrastructure, to provide for the common defense. But when we get, and he, and he makes the point about taxes that you know they're never gonna be popular, um, but they are, as Oliver Wendell Holmes less said later, a, a price we pay for civilization. We can make it fair, realizing that there's an enlightened self-interest in supporting the community. Um, but that if we pass on to future generations excessive deficit and debt, that is not only deeply unfair, it is ungrateful and unwise, and that is a path that has destroyed empires before. Religion and morality is another pillar of liberty. Washington was not, has been, I think, mischaracterized in the past as an orthodox uh, Christian in the little O sense. Um, he was a, a man of faith. He was baptized in Anglican and, Anglican and served on his local vestry. Um, but he was also a Mason and very proud of that and, and loved reading the Stoics, particularly Seneca. He was focused on the importance of religion and morality for really wise and utilitarian purposes. A self-governing society depends on self-governing people, and religion is, in his view, traditionally the best way to treat, to teach morality on a large scale. And he was passionate about religious tolerance as well. Go back and look at his letter to the Hebrew congregation in um, Newport, Rhode Island, where he really says that America is going to be a beacon of religious liberty. You come here, if you play by our rules and adopt our basic customs, we will all, not just different sects of Christianity, but anybody. There's a note he writes to a foreman at uh, Mount Vernon, which is fascinating, where he says, I don't care if the person's Catholic, Protestant, uh, Jewish, or Mahatman, or of no religion at all. Hire the best person. But he is passionate about religious tolerance, and it is uh, because he wants to encourage people to have religious faith, not that he himself uh, was doctrinaire. There's a fascinating story I found. Um, he 
refused to kneel or take communion in church. And one day in Philadelphia, when he's president, uh, a preacher noticed it and decided to gently rebuke him in the sermon. And the senator said afterwards, did you notice that the priest kind of knocked you a little bit for not kneeling or taking communion? He said, I did. And he said, well, what are you going to do about it? And he said, well, I'm not going to go there again. Well, why? Well, because if I did that, and I stuck in my ways, and I'm paraphrasing here, obviously, because he's sounding like sort of an Indiana politician right now. Um, he didn't want to be accused of, politi- uh, of hypocrisy or using religion for political purposes. He was very sensitive to that. He was very focused on um, false modesty and false pretenses in a way that, you know, a figure as semi-contemporary as Holden Caulfield might appreciate. He does not uh, dig phonies. Um, But he understands the importance of religion and religious pluralism as a glue that can hold society together. Um, Also, education. Civic education in particular. But he is our least schooled founding father, least formally educated. He only spoke English. Um, Most of the founding fathers spoke French. Um, James Madison spoke Hebrew. Um, He is the least formally educated founding father, so he is a real autodidact. He has a remarkable library that the Fred Smith Library up by Mount Vernon is reaccumulating. Um, and he's very passionate, if a bit insecure, about his education. But because of that, he actually values education in some ways more than many. And he had a dream of building a national university, and in fact donated money to create it on the land which now hosts the Naval Observatory in Washington, where the Vice President lives. He wanted to build a national university to bring people together from all across the country, the best and the brightest, to create really intentionally a governing class, to create a national character, but also to, so that they could help overcome their regional discriminations and prejudices. And understand that, you know, you know just because you're from South Carolina doesn't mean you can't be my friend. Uh, and, and develop those friendships that could themselves be glue for the country going forward. Um, He's passionate about this. He proposes this over and over, and Congress continues to ignore him. He goes back and forth with Hamilton in successive drafts and keeps putting it back in, and Hamilton keeps taking it out, and finally convinces him that he can have a paragraph on it, but really leave it to a later message. And just a reminder that no president gets whatever they want from Congress, even George Washington. He couldn't get Congress to buy into this. And that's why we've got the University of North Carolina, the University of Virginia. They went states-based for our great early public education institutions. But the reason Washington is so passionate about this at the end of the day is because he understands that enlightened opinion, and that's a phrase he uses, enlightened opinion is necessary to a self-governing society. That's an obligation we all have of living in a democracy, is that our votes matter, our civic participation matters, and that requires education. Because otherwise it could just devolve to kind of a mob. And we all have an obligation to encourage education and to inculcate that. And civic civic education in particular, he wanted to develop American, distinctly American traditions, American literature. Um, But the civic education really was key because that itself is a social societal glue. And that's one of the reasons I think Hamilton itself was such a great gift, because it, the, the play, because it sort of helped make the old stories new again in a really relevant way. But that's an obligation we all have to carry that forward. Um, And finally, a foreign policy of independence. And and this is the line entangling alliances. Um, Washington's pillar of liberty was a foreign policy of independence. It has been twisted at different eras and different times into uh, meaning a, um, being excused to excuse isolationism, particularly in the first America First movement in early World War II, which I'll get to in a second. That's a total twisting of what Washington meant if you look at the full context. And you can tell, you know, what Washington means because this is the sum total of his wisdom. So you look at his letters, look at his speeches, look, you know, and you see common strains of thought. What Washington wanted to make sure is that America wasn't acting as a satellite state of another nation, particularly European. We sometimes forget about geography and the importance of it. Washington as a soldier and a farmer never did. And the presence of the Atlantic Ocean was a great gift to our independence as a nation. Will Rogers, a century later and change, had a great line about that. He said, America has the two best friends any nation ever had. You know what they are? The Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. (laughs) We were, for a long time, isolated from the problems, the constant turmoils, the constant conflicts of Europe. And why would we want to throw in with any other nation and assume their troubles for our own? 
we could take advantage of our peculiar position in the world. And, and what wanted, Washington wanted, and he wrote this several times, at least 20 years to develop economically and militarily as an independent nation on the world stage. And then he says we can do what we'd like as justice and interest compels us. And that's why he refused to throw in with the French. Even though, and, and that made him tarred, by the way, in domestic politics as a lackey of England, uh, which was one of the conspiracy theories being floated uh, of Washington at the time that he was a Manchurian candidate, we would say today, of the British. Um, his point was we needed to remain independent. That was a great asset for us as a nation. And he really did discourage political um, alliances with any nation. He championed commercial ties. In some ways, Presage the best face of globalization, that commercial ties between nations would unite people in a, in a sort of web of mutuality and mutual self-interest um, without uh, getting into the kind of poli permanent political alliances that could lead to wars. This becomes important later on after the address. Um, it is an enlightened position. It is widely misunderstood and often reviled. But Washington really stuck to it. And he also believed, of course, in, in the precept of peace through strength, which he got from an ancient Roman dictum. Um, he was a, not a fan of large standing armies, um, but he really did understand that to prepare for war is the best way to secure peace. Um, but that we needed to remain independent on the world stage to ensure our own independence. These were the pillars of liberty that Washington proposed. Focus on national unity, political moderation, fiscal responsibility, religious tolerance and pluralism, education, and a foreign policy of independence. They remain great advice for a nation. Not all the things he wrote have perfect applicability to today. The world has changed. He could not have anticipated jet airliners and transcontinental travel in the same way. But those precepts guided us very effectively, if imperfectly, for a long time. And it's striking to me that they don't line up neatly with any prepackaged political ideology and certainly no party agenda. And frankly, you know, we're overdue for a realignment in our politics because there is not a coherence in our political uh, ideology or even the practicality of big tents that are necessary to build broad coalitions. But that to me is something heartening. There is something that everyone can relate to, whether you are liberal or libertarian or anywhere in between in Washington's farewell address. It remains a unifying and wise document, and that is as Washington intended it. What's fascinating is the afterlife of the farewell address, because it has largely been forgotten, but for your grandparents or great-grandparents, it wouldn't have been. It was mandatorily taught in America's public schools. And I'm gonna take you through just a very quick um, history of the afterlife of Washington's farewell to show how central it was to national debates. Jefferson, as I mentioned, was bitterly fighting with Washington towards the end of his second term. They did not, they were not on speaking terms at the end of Washington's life. Martha Washington particularly resented him. Thought he was duplicitous. There's some evidence for that. Um, excuse me. But when, after the election of 1800, Jefferson defeats Adams, his inaugural address, which is one of the great inaugural addresses in history, he becomes a born-again Washingtonian after fighting Washington on many of these underlying policies and principles. His inaugural address is basically a rearticulation of Washington's farewell address. It's a reminder of sometimes where you stand or as a matter of where you sit. Not in the opposition, but with the responsibilities of the presidency, his perspective changed. <clears throat> Andrew Jackson's farewell address is itself an extended rumination on the wisdom of Washington's farewell address. That's really all it is, warning against separation, secession, and civil war. Saying that if we go down that path that Washington warned us not to do, we will violate the wisdom, that birthright, that gift he gave us, and we do so at our peril. Turns out he was right. In the 1860 campaign, Abraham Lincoln quoted Washington's farewell address as part of his standard stump speech making the case that the newfound Republican Party was not a regional party, as Democrats said, but was in fact something defending the principles that Washington had laid out. And when Civil War did break out, Lincoln required that the farewell address not only be read in Congress, 
which it remains today, once a year on Washington's birthday, but read aloud to Union troops to remind them what they were fighting for, that principle of national unity. And after Lincoln's death in Reconstruction, a lot of folks said, you know, if we'd only listened to Washington, we wouldn't have had the Civil War. And so it becomes standard teaching in America's public schools. And throughout the late 19th century, it is taught to be memorized. There are contests for the best oratory around the farewell address. Who has the best essay about the meaning and applicability of the farewell address? It's constantly being, it's consciously being deployed to reunite the nation as catechism, as mythology, if you will, as foundational wisdom. And, and in the book, I've got these fascinating even postcards and, uh, and school lessons that show its centrality to the American psyche because they felt it was so unwise to have abandoned its precepts and they wanted to undo that damage. Um, and then something fascinating starts to happen in the late 19th century. First of all, technology starts to outpace the idea of the ocean providing a, a barrier to the troubles of the world. Secretaries of State start saying, you know, maybe we've held on to this Washington wisdom thing a little bit too literally. We can't. We're a great power. We should engage the world. Um, Lincoln starts to replace Washington in some respects as a national hero, uh, but also the Gettysburg Address starts to replace Washington's farewell as America's great unifying go-to civic scripture. Um, they are complementary addresses in some way, um, but they're very different. I think there is a practical reason for why the Gettysburg Address uh, supplanted Washington's farewell as something we memorized in schools. Um, Washington's farewell address is 6,000 words. Gettysburg Address is 272. Which would you rather memorize? Um, but also, I think if you look at them side by side, um, it's fascinating because Washington's farewell address is sort of the Old Testament of American politics. It is these rules of behavior dispatched by a distant God. And the Gettysburg Address is sort of the New Testament. It's a poetic rumination on life after death. And um, it is more accessible in many ways. The slog through the farewell dress and its original prose can be tough, um, but it is transporting and it is prescient and it retains its relevance. I'll skip ahead to World War I because that's when it really takes its first hit. The whole debate over whether we should get involved in World War I is conducted between two Washington scholars or former biographers, President Woodrow Wilson and Henry Cabot Lodge, head of the Senate Republicans. They both are Washington biographers. They are conducting a debate about whether or not the United States should get involved in the First World War, basically around who's a better inheritor of Washington's wisdom. Ultimately, Lodge loses the fight when it comes to entry into World War I. The world does not end. In fact, once America gets in, the war ends relatively quickly. Um, and Washington gets knocked off his pedestal a bit. I will say that Lodge won the argument about getting involved in the League of Nations, which was a much more direct insult to Washington's wisdom. Um, so call it a split decision. In between World War I and World War II, there's a much more fascinating debate um, about whether we should have gotten in than people recognize. What were the forces that led us to get in? Why did we abandon Washington's wisdom? And in the run-up to World War II, um, there is a group of folks who call themselves America First, and they brandish uh, Washington's image and the farewell address warning. And these are respected Americans like Henry Ford and Charles Lindbergh, and also crackpot anti-Semites, and if someone could make a credible case that there's a Venn diagram overlap between the two at times. Um, but they don't want America to get involved in the Second World War. And they quote Washington's farewell. And it's a pretty compelling argument at the time. People don't want to get involved. They really consider the First World War an aberration and a mistake. Um, but some of the misappropriation of Washington's farewell itself is instructive. And one of the most fascinating and I think disturbing scenes, not only in the book, but perhaps in all American history, occurs in uh, 1939 at Madison Square Garden in New York City, where the German-American Bund holds a rally. Um, and it's supposed to be a pro-American rally. Um, but when you went inside, there was a 30-foot banner of Washington at the podium, flanked by swastikas. It was a American Nazi rally. And it looks like something out of Dark Mirror, and it's, there's a documentary that just is coming out about it. And the keynote address is all about Washington's farewell address. 
They're passing out pamphlets calling him, you know, an Aryan superhero and the first Nazi. And, and they're saying, you know, Washington would have been with us. He was right. We shouldn't get involved in other nations' wars. We should be focused on fiscal discipline and religion and morality. And they make a, a real case that they're really representing Washington's wisdom. Of course, they're not on a few fundamental levels. The most obvious is the German-American Bund was literally being funded by the Third Reich. They are literally representing a foreign power trying to influence our democratic debates. But it's a great example of how founding wisdom can be twisted. And it's a perfect example, I think, of what Washington called the danger of those pretend patriots. People who are trying to misappropriate the Founding Fathers' wisdom and to make it something exclusive, to make it something exclusionary. It's a cudgel to divide Americans against one another. And the fact they tried to appropriate Washington actually led to a massive backlash. Um, and the German-American Bund was busted for taking money uh, from uh, the Third Reich, and several folks were put in jail. And that was actually uh, an, an instrumental moment in, in pushing back the tide of Isolation is sympathy. Um, that was, of course, crystallized ultimately by Pearl Harbor. Um, and Washington's farewell, though, it's, it, it starts to fade from the American psyche in the wake of all this. It is brought up during debates over the Vietnam War. I found a fascinating passage from a Gary Wills book about uh, some of the really more high-minded anti-Vietnam War hippie protesters quoting Washington's farewell, saying, you know, that we're representing that tradition. Um, it comes up a bit. Reagan. Um, well, I should be getting ahead of myself. Eisenhower was fascinated by it and ba based his entire farewell address on it. Um, that was explicit. I show in, in the book there are memos where they're drawing directly on that inspiration, um, in particular as a farewell warning. Um, Johnson loved quoting it about the importance of education uh, and politics being civil, if not nonpartisan. Uh, Reagan loved quoting it on the importance of religion and morality, quoted in his Moscow State University address. Um, and then in more recent times, George H.W. Bush quoted it um, in his farewell address at West Point, uh, making a case for um, kind of a, a, an engaged nation in the world, um, saying it's not a contradiction. And uh, Barack Obama quoted Washington's farewell at length in his farewell address in Chicago, which happened to be the night that, uh, the day the book was released. And so the paperback has a whole section where I spoke to one of Obama's speechwriters about um, why he was driven to that. And, and Obama's big warning was, don't take, it was, his speech was about threats to our democracy. And he really felt that Washington's wisdom was relevant, was prescient, particularly about folks turning Americans against one another. Um, that jealous strain and the cycle of revenge that can enter our politics, which really can uh, be devastating to the body politic and which we are indulging today and have been for some time, I think quite dangerously. But Washington's farewell address, I think, retains its relevance. It is timeless American wisdom. It is extraordinarily timely for today. And I think it remains a document that can unite the nation. People from different political persuasions can find wisdom in this. It can be a document that can restore a sense of common ground and common purpose to our politics, which is what we desperately need. And part of my hope is that we can ri give rise to a new generation of Washingtonians who want to put country above party and to focus on the national interest over special interests and that balance between individual liberty and generational responsibility and to unite our nation once again and towards common purpose. That's what we desperately need. It is within our grasp. There is a tradition that transcends hyperpartisan politics that offers perspective on our problems today. We have Washington's wisdom to guide us. They are principles. They are not rigid strictures, but they still hold for me the force of revelation and that's why it was a delight to write the book and um, to be with you here tonight. And now I'd be delighted to take some questions. Thank you. So again, if anyone does have any questions, just please uh, go to the side where the microphones are, uh, and we'll just do a back and forth. And don't be shy. I can handle hecklers. <laughs> or I can just sign some books and go home. Ah, hello. Hi. I enjoyed your speech very much. You're and kind, it is thank you. It's extremely timely. Um, historians, lawyers, and constitutional scholars have noted lately that our um, democracy is under siege <clears throat> and there appear to be some cracks 
Do you agree with that? Oh, or God, yes. What do you see as our future given our past? Well, look, um, I think uh, we are in a very challenging time for our democracy, and what is troubling is how many of Washington's warnings we have unwisely ignored, how many of these forces we have indulged. Um, and so I think it's incumbent upon us to take some of these first principles and apply them going forward. I think we do need to focus on national unity more, what unites us, not what divides us. We need to focus on asserting the real strength and wisdom of moderation again, rather than simply being satisfied with the choice between two increasingly polarized parties, although we do have asymmetric polarization in our country. I think that fiscal discipline has been ditched effectively in Washington. I think the most recent bills that have passed codify that. Um, New Hampshire has a great tradition of standing up for that. Um, that tradition is utterly politically homeless. I think we need to value the role of religion and morality in our society and politics in a spirit of toleration and pluralism. Um, I think we need to desperately reinvest in civic education again. I think that provides a current currency of communication. Without it, we are in real trouble. Um, but I think also it's gonna have to come through forms of patriotic philanthropy as well as civic organizations. I don't think it's gonna come you know, from school budgets necessarily, though perhaps it should. Um, and then I think being very mindful and wary of foreign attempts to influence our elections and our civic debates. Social media gives new ways to do that that Washington couldn't have imagined. Um, all these things are incredibly relevant. We have, I think for too long, uh, treated democracy as a spectator sport, and we have indulged politicians who have the worst face of populism, which is dividing Americans against one another, often being exactly the pretend patriots that Washington warned against. It is not patriotic to wield an American flag and to set Americans against one another. The calling card to demagogues through history is us against them. We should instinctively and historically watch out for those folks. You know, the, the Bible and the American flag don't belong to any one political party. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that, for me, is, is really what we should pay great attention to with a sense of real responsibility. You know, we've come too far. The Founding Fathers were utterly justified in not knowing whether their experiment would succeed. It never had before. Adam said there hadn't been yet a democracy that didn't die by suicide. But this is our watch. This is our responsibility. This is our birthright. It is our job to defend liberal democracy, frankly, at home and abroad. And, um, and, and I don't think there's any job we have that is more important. And I think right now politics has become so toxic uh, that it forces good people out of the political conversation because they see it as mean-spirited and it is ugly and it is toxic and it's personally destructive. And why bother? But that seeds the field to folks who do view it as a form of toxic teamism. And that hurts the country further. And you in New Hampshire have a particular responsibility because of the primary um, to get engaged and to be a, a moderating force. Um, I, think, I think the fact that so many folks in the center right were sort of rhino hunted out of the Republican Party made the ship not have sufficient ballast to withstand some of, of, of the appeals of conservative populism. I, I also think that you know it may be time to build an alternative architecture in the center and no longer rely on the two parties because I think they're artificially polarized. Um, I think the decision to, I mean, the fact we have regional political parties that are ideologically divided is a departure from our best traditions um, and, um, and also from Washington's wisdom. I think we need a, a big tent party again. I personally, I think the center right and the center left need to unite. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, what role, if any, does the media play in like sort of restoring this balance? As part of part of the issue is th sure. the media has to make money, and being and in the center isn't of... necessarily the most lucrative sort of place to be for the for the most part. It seems. Well, it, it, it's a, it's a great and important question. First of all, journalism is a mission driven business. That's what everyone needs to understand. It is a mission. You get into it because there are deeper forms of compensation. If you want to make money, you know, you go to Wall Street um, or, you know, a hedge fund, I suppose. Um, 
it's a mission-driven business. It is a business, and we need to understand that. Free press is not free, and you know, journalistic independence requires financial independence. We need to take that responsibility seriously, and the nature of media businesses is in real flux. You know, but not for nothing, in the mid-20th century, which is a time of great stability in our politics, where voting patterns in Congress looked like a, a bell curve, um, you had a, nation, a generation united by the experience in World War II and the Great Depression. You had newspapers that were strong and flourishing, and by and large, uh, aimed for the ideal of objectivity. There were partisan newspapers, but less, to a lesser extent than they had in the past. Um, and a number of forces really helped us have a, a, a really fairly well-functioning democracy for all its inevitable imperfections, uh, where, um, you know, we were able to reason together. You know, divided government didn't mean dysfunctional government. We got the Marshall Plan, we got the highway bills, we got the Civil Rights Act, you know, all the achievements of the Reagan administration, even Clinton Gingrich hated each other's guts, but they were able to get things done. And, and media played a role in that. I think the rise of hyperpartisan media, um, which is a function of media fragmentation, which is itself a function of technology, is a real challenge. Um, that said, I think when people, um, I think partisan media uh, does distort our domestic de debates, particularly hyperpartisan media. And, and, and people who consume it sometimes feel that they are quite intentionally joining a club, they have found their tribe. They don't, I think, fully appreciate how much of a business model it is, and a cynical one at that. It's called cocooning. Basically, um, you want to get people, you want a narrow but intense niche audience in a fragmented media environment. And the best way, some people believe, in the political and news space, is to get people coming back because you get them addicted to anger and anxiety. And inevitably, that's directed at the other. And that starts turning our politicians on their head, too. They start taking notes from partisan media. You know, the polarization of the two parties compounds that problem. Closed partisan primaries. And for the rig system of redistricting only creating 35 swing districts, competitive districts in all of Congress. All these things conspire, but media plays a role in it. It is not media's fault. But I think the, the overall effect of the rise of partisan media has been incredibly toxic. And this problem is not recent. This has been going on for decades. And, and I understand, you know, a lot of principled conservatives felt there was an implicit liberal bias when there were three networks and major papers, and I understand that. Their corrective was to create alternatives with explicit bias. And, and that, and you know, sometimes under the banner of fair and balanced. And that just kept getting us more and more off center. And so, you, and, and you know, that's before you have the rise of hate news and fake news, which is itself a very specific problem, um, sometimes motivated by money. Um, you know, there's a profit motive with, you know, confirmation bias clickbait, with programmatic advertising. So, um, I mean, in a study that occurred, gosh, over a decade ago, um, John Stewart was the most trusted man in news at the time. Uh, I think there's a certain wisdom to that, but probably not the uh, Walter Cronkite that was imagined. Um, but trust in all forms of media were down, including C-SPAN, which is insane. It is literally uncut direct footage. It can't be biased, and yet people felt it was biased. So that's a symptom of the distrust that gets seeded. Um, Putting that genie at the back of the bottle is going to be difficult. I think people need to realize you vote with your eyeballs and your wallets every day. If you watch and consume hyperpartisan news, you become part of the problem because it can be tracked in real time and people say that's what they want. I also think it's incumbent upon us to, I mean, at the Daily Beast, I'm proud that we are nonpartisan but not neutral. Um, you know, we're not going to please everyone and you'd be a fool to try, but we field columnists who run the gamut from liberal to libertarian. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that's important. That also means, by the way, that you don't pretend there's a mythic moral equivalence on any issue. Um, I think the way we're monetizing websites right now itself needs to be challenged. I think companies that have these major advertising buys need to be more discerning about where they put their dollars. Um, because very often they end up fueling and funding hate news and fake news, unintentionally. So they need to be a little bit more discerning about where they put their dollars and try to support the sites and places that are doing it right. But ultimately, it's also a citizen's responsibility. You know, you vote with your eyeballs and your wallets every day. It's not just every two years at the ballot booth. So I think taking that responsibility seriously is important too. Any other questions? I'm delighted I've answered all of them. Thank you very much. I'd be delighted to sign some books.